The long national nightmare is over. Chase Elliott back to victory lane in the NASCAR Cup Series. Chase Elliott visited Victory Lane in the Cup Series for the first time in 560 days, 42 winless races. He also broke the Hooters curse. Hooters goes back to Victory Lane as a primary in the Cup Series for the first time since 1992 when Alan Kowicki did it. For Chase Elliott, this was a much, much, much needed victory. I don't know if I said much enough there, but I think you got the emphasis. He desperately needed this win. And it came at a time where he's coming off of back-to-back top fives, the first time he had done that since last year when he did it at Nashville and then the Chicago Street Course. So he goes out there and he picks up a win. First off, massively needed that win. We all know that. Chase Elliott needed the win. All of his fans are like, Hendrick Mosworth's giving up on Chase Elliott. He doesn't seem to care anymore. I think he'll probably end up retiring. You know, the irrational fan base, the Dallas Cowboys of NASCAR fans here. So Chase Elliott, he rebounds. He gets that win. His last 13 wins in the Cup Series have come at 13 different tracks. I don't know if people understand just how impressive that actually is. And I'm not here to to ride Chase Elliott, you know, like some of the Chase Elliott fanboys do. I'm just saying, that's an impressive stat for him to have. And now they head to Talladega, where obviously we all know anybody can win. And his last win before this past weekend at Texas came at Talladega, October 2nd, 2022. So maybe he can go back to back. Who knows? But for Chase Elliott, he's locked into the playoffs now. And it's happened in a race that got a little bit out of hand, if we're being completely honest here. There was cautions on cautions. You had multiple people throwing just caution to the wind, if we're just going to keep saying caution here, and just sending it. And Denny Hamlin talked about that after the race when he obviously got caught up in his own accident of his own doing. There was nothing Chase Elliott did wrong there. And Denny basically said afterwards, he was like, yeah, he said, I was just going to send it. And he's like, you know, you take that chance. And obviously he sent it a little bit too hard. The old Daniel Ricardo lick the lamp, lick, lick the lamp. Do not lick lamps, lick the stamp and send it. Please don't lick lamps. 16 cautions, 72 laps. 14 of those cautions were natural cautions, not stage cautions. And we had literally so, there's so many of them. Jimmy Johnson decided to spice things up a little bit when he decided to crash early on. He brought out the first caution because he didn't bring out enough cautions in the IndyCar series when he was down there trying to cosplay as an IndyCar driver. So he came back over to NASCAR and he's like, let me continue this tradition here. So he spun twice this weekend, once in practice. Uh, had to do a ton of repairs to that car. It spins again in the race. However, didn't ruin his race because he did manage to finish on the lead lap, which is, I know everybody is going to be like, yeah, Jimmy Johnson finished on the lead lap. Not that impressive. It is actually impressive. 29th lead lap, 29th. So good for Jimmy. Finally gets a full race under his belt and doesn't get caught up in somebody else's accident for once or doesn't end up out of the race. But he's spiced things up a little bit. Brought out the first yellow. Then you had the Joe Gibbs pit crews out there acting like they're SMI and just kind of half-assing things in a sense. And they left the lug nut, or they left the uh, socket, sorry, not the lug nut. They left the socket on the lug nut on uh, Ty Gibbs' car, so they had to bring him back in. And NASCAR was like, oh, we just missed it. Which, in fairness, I can see that. Like, missing, you're not exactly looking for the socket to still be on the lug. So... They missed that. Honestly, it should have been a penalty for taking equipment outside the box. Well, they still had to come in, take it off regardless, and then start at the back. So that was the penalty. The only other, like, NASCAR would have just sent him to the, you know, rear of the line. So essentially, it was a self-service penalty for him. Loose wheel on the 19. James Small and Martin Trucks Jr. continued to bicker back and forth on the radio. I don't know if they actually like each other, but I guess they do. Oh, Christopher Bell decided to be a little bit like Jimmy Johnson, spin off of turn four. He backs into the wall really hard. Jimmy didn't hit anything. C. Bell did back it into the wall hard, which then caused Alex Bowman to spin trying to avoid the wreck. And then that caused John Harnemichek to spin to try to avoid the wreck too. And then he just one two to Alex Bowman. He was like, bam, bam, done, moving on. Uh, Bowman's day was pretty much finished after that. I believe it was finished. Kyle Busch then treated Carson Hosovar, how Carson Hosovar generally treats most people in every series that he's in, and just absolutely punted him, getting into turn one right there. Hosovar did rebound for a top 10 finish, his first top 10 finish in the NASCAR Cup Series with a 10th Kyle Busch, finished ninth. So those two probably don't love each other too much, but Hosovar tends to have this sort of... uh, this sort of impression on people where they're just like, you know what, we're going to send him because he would do the same thing to us. Kyle Larson's wheel fell off. And to quote Ron White, it fell off. It fell the F off because apparently the tire changer was absent on lug nut day at tire college and the wheel fell off. Honestly, it wasn't the changer's fault. They will be suspended for two weeks, but that was more of a systemic problem that we have with the 
tires at times, but fell off well into a run, which is very odd. But Kyle Larson ends up having to go back around three quarters of the track, dragging the uh, splitter, dragging the underbody on the car. He came over the radio, asked Cliff Daniels, you know, is this going to affect the downforce? Cliff was like, no, you should be fine. Maybe a little bit for rear downforce. Larson could just never get back up through the field. He ends up finishing 21st on the lead lap, but not indicative of where he ran at for most of the day. Led 77 laps before disaster struck there. Moving on to more cautions here. We have Josh Berry. Ricky Stenhouse decided to clear himself. Not clear. Doesn't matter to Ricky Stenhouse, Recky Spinhouse, as some people on the internet like to refer to him. He just cuts across the nose of the four car. Four car ends up spinning out. And then, not great. Ricky basically went all, I turn left now, good luck, everybody. And then just went. Josh Berry then crashed again, just for good measure. Wanted to really make sure that put themselves out of their misery there. Michael McDowell crashed on a restart, trying to race Ross Chastain for the lead. Not Ross's fault. The Ross Chastain don't give an F tour while it continues to roll on. Did not contribute to this tour stop right here with Michael McDowell. Bubba decided that he was going to repeat last year, but saved it. (laughs) Bubba, he runs up front enough now that I feel like he should be accustomed to this. But... Like last year we saw at Texas, same thing. Big run down the backstretch ends up costing him the win of the race. Same thing this week. Or this week, Big run down the backstretch, him trying to block it, doesn't really save it or doesn't block it. Then goes in the corner, spins out, gets the 14 car as well. Uh, 14 car got most of the damage. The 23 didn't actually hit anything. And he manages to finish seventh. Bubba, that is. The 14 car did rebound as well. He finished the sixth. Very weird day in terms of people spending then rebounding as well. Ryan Blaney brought out a caution uh, for a hit into turn two. NASCAR on Fox didn't show it, but NASCAR's re- or Twitter account did show it. My one complaint about the booth this week, or the broadcast this week, and I'm not going to harp on it too much. We have multiple times during this where Fox just doesn't have a replay of it or doesn't show us a replay of what happens. So then we have to go back and watch a replay of it. This Blaney wreck is a perfect example of that they didn't show it and it's like why if we have these onboards why don't we show them they love to go to onboards at fox like that's if they can go to an onboard they will immediately and i don't love that i like the idea of getting a better picture kyle larson jimmy johnson door banging down the backstretch at one point racing for position all we saw was an onboard looking out the side of the car why if there's an angle from a car behind them or from a wide shot please show it because we would like to know why this was happening or what it looked like because inside the car, you can't really tell. That's my biggest complaint this week. And you have an eventual pass for the lead happening between Denny Hamlin and Tyler Reddick. And then Clint Boyer goes, this was big. This was big and we missed it. No, that's not acceptable. <laughs> like, you know, those cars up front are pitting. Stop paying attention to them for a minute when you know that the eventual race leader is passing each other for position. I don't care if it's for 16th on track at the moment. That will eventually be the race lead. You should probably show that and not in a replay three laps later. That was really frustrating uh, to me. And then you have the Denny Hamlin crash there at the end uh, where he just kind of sent it. You have the Ross Chastain crash. I'm looking through the list of incidents here. Kyle Larson brought out another caution with the 71 of Zane Smith being involved. Ricky Stenhouse brought out a caution. John Hunter Nemechek brought out another caution uh, there. The 15 and the 21 brought out another caution coming up to set up a green-white checker. And then we end up going to overtime, overtime. And then finally, the one car and the 24 car run into each other on the white flag lap coming off of turn two. That was more of a racing incident to me. But overall, Texas... Uh, it's Texas, right? I don't necessarily think what we saw was a good race. Good racing. Was it entertaining? Yeah, it was entertaining because you're kind of like, who's not going to make it through the corner this time? And at times, it definitely felt like it devolved into a pretty bad... From the end of stage one, we had a green flag run to start stage two of 13 laps. Caution. Eight laps of green. Caution. Three laps of green. Caution. 12 laps of green. Caution. One lap of green. Caution. 17 laps of green, caution. And that was the end of stage two. Not a lot of green flag running going on here. 16 cautions for 72 laps. It was a 260, well, originally supposed to be 267 lap race. 276 laps is the total here. So just, what, 204 laps of green flag running. Because we started off with a 50 lap run. We also got another 45 lap run there in stage two. Another 20 in stage two as well. And then man, it just 
devolved into chaos there at the end. So the question now is, do you repave Texas? Do you reconfigure Texas? I am still much under the belief that you just reconfigure Texas back to the way it was. Get rid of the nonsense that Eddie Gossage and Marcus Smith decided to do down in turn one, raise the banking back up, narrow the track down back to where it was, and let's see how that goes once again. Don't even repave, actually, don't even repave the rest of the track. Well, I say that, but like it's so frustrating to repave the rest of the track when after seven years you've got good wear on it to start all over again. That's a bummer. Do not turn it into another Atlanta. Please don't do that. But I think just turning it back would actually help solve a lot of the problems that we see here. So I think that there's a lot to be said for that. I would probably give this race like a 78, 77, 78, somewhere in that range. Uh, passing was still really hard. But one thing now that I'm noticing about the Gen 7 car is like one, two, three can really start to pull away. And then four on back, position wise are kind of all bunched together and the racing might be good back there and we never see it unfortunately but yeah i think there's a lot to be done with this car still and i'll have a video about that this week because i've been thinking about it a lot probably a 77 for this race chase elliott winning certainly will help it out in jeff gluck's poll for sure danny hamlin crashing again will certainly help it out as well but for me yeah, I, I think for Texas, like that's not bad. It certainly certainly made up for the boredom that we had the last two weeks, although Richmond was somewhat entertaining when we had strategy outside of that. No, Martinsville was just not a very good race uh, top to bottom. This race, pretty decent. Uh, I know a lot of people love to have cautions, a lot of restarts. I would like to see some green flag passing, some guys racing for the lead, stuff like that. Overall, like I said, not the worst Texas race we've ever seen. Not the best Texas race we've ever seen. Very acceptable. If they want to leave it how it is, fine, whatever. It's become this wild card, unpredictable race. Really good crowd, too. Hats off to them. SMI managed to put people in the seats. Couldn't repaint the start-finish line. Couldn't get the lights to turn on in turn three for the truck race. Got a lot of people in the stands for the cup race, though, which is, I mean, hats off to them, right? If you're doing something good, you deserve to get recognized for it just as much as you deserve to get criticized for when you do something bad. So congrats to them for getting that done. So let me know in the comments what you think of this race. Chase Elliott wins. I'm sure a lot of people will be very happy about that. I did see, if you don't follow RJ Rogers on TikTok, you don't have to follow him. Just go look at his TikTok. He continues to dump cans of Coca-Cola over his head after Chase wins. I don't recommend doing that. It seems like, well, if you have a lot of hair, it's probably a real pain to get all of that out. But hey, I like to see people happy, so good for him. La, la, subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard, Instagram and Twitter at BreakHardBlog.